Hi, it's the 29th of July, and you are tuned into the Bay Area Vegetable Trials Virtual Field Day, a newscast covering the commercial vegetable trials from the Bay and Thumb region of Michigan. I'm your host, Ben Phillips. We've got five stories today that will take us from Frankenmuth to Fenton up to Essexville. Each trial is funded differently from industry and government partners to grants and contract work from growers. Our first report will be taking us to the Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center for some industry funded work on pickles. We're going to Ben from several days ago to give us the scoop. Hey, we're out here at the Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center in the pickle plot. It's about one acre among hundreds of acres of other field crops, but it's an important place to do pickle research. Michigan grows about 25,000 acres of pickling cucumbers. That's more than any other vegetable in our state. And Michigan grows more pickling cucumbers than any other state. So this is actually a pretty good spot to be doing that work. We do small plot work here with about 20, 20 foot row lengths of several different varieties. This year uh, we're doing 34 varieties from four different companies. Uh, Rick Juan, Nunnams, Bejo, and Seminus. We harvest the pickles in one pass, just like a mechanical harvester would. We pick the whole plant, remove all the pickles from them, and then we size them out on a grater and uh, weigh each class and count each class. And then we do some length and diameter measurements, and we cut them open to look for any defects on the inside. Uh, and then we brine them. We bring them to Housebeck Pickle Company. They toss them in their big tanks for us. And after a few months, we take them out and we invite briners from around uh, this part of the state to come and evaluate those to see what kind of pickle they become. Here at the research farm, we work mostly with seedless cucumbers or parthenocarpic cucumbers, as they are also called. There's really only four companies that are involved right now. Uh, two of them have been at it a long time. Rick Swan and Nunnams are probably the leaders with this pickle type. Rick Schwann has had a couple of very strong, consistent performing varieties over the years, including Bowie and Gershwin. Nunnams also is a strong player in this field with V5025 and V5031. Bejo is a relatively newcomer to this uh, sector. They've had a lot of work in slicing cucumbers and now they're entering the market with pickling cucumbers in our, uh, in our part of the world. Uh, they've done a lot of work in Europe. Um, and so mechanically harvested cucumbers are kind of a new thing for them. But they are just starting to bring some varieties into, into this sector, including Aristan and Amarok. Both have performed very well in these trials. And then finally, Seminus is uh, also working on some parthenocarpic varieties and they're still in the pre-commercial phase uh, but they've been looking pretty good in these trials so keep an eye out for those. Our trials show that growers can expect between 200 and 400 bushels per acre on these types of pickles with a plant population around 30,000 plants per acre and that's, that's about half, um, a little more than half of what you would plant for a standard pickle takes about 250 bushels per acre to break even. So why would you want to grow these pickles? There are some distinct advantages to the grower in particular. Uh, one, they have the potential to yield higher. Two, they don't require bees and there's a lot of advantages to that. There's a cost to the bees themselves. There's also a cost to when there are poor conditions for pollination and you get a lot more crooked pickles and stubby pickles and nubby pickles. Um, they're also a bit tougher skinned so when you're mechanically harvesting them you tend to get fewer bro broken pickles. And they, they also can require less fertilizer uh, anecdotally from growers I've spoken to they seem to require less fertilizer so there are some cost savings involved. On the other side there is a more expensive seed so that's why it does require a slightly higher bushels per acre in the end for a break even. A standard pickle is usually closer to 200 bushels per acre for breaking even. On the brining side, 
customers seem to prefer a pickle in a jar with few seeds floating around. So they make really nice spears. But the same tough skin that growers enjoy can be a problem on the brining side. Sometimes, some varieties, and in just certain years, the brine has trouble penetrating the tougher skin and fully brining the entire pickle all the way through. And that results in large losses at the briner. Other years, the skin is thin enough and soft enough to allow full brining, but still tough enough that customers notice. Uh, and they don't like it. Ah, oh, these pickles are too tough. So companies are making improvements every year, looking for new varieties and new traits that strike a balance on that skin toughness for both the grower, the briner, and the consumer. Another question that we're going to be asking this year is if certain foliar fertilizers can be applied to reduce the occurrence of hollow centers in pickling cucumbers. Why is that important? Well, when CO2 is produced as a byproduct of fermentation, as microorganisms eat sugar, Sometimes the cucumbers can trap that CO2 inside their skins and it creates a mushy pickle that won't cut well as a chip or a spear or a stacker. It, it even really compromises a whole pickle. You have this soft center that doesn't snap well. This is affectionately known in the industry as a bloater because they end up floating in the tank. If a cucumber comes out of the field with air gaps in the fruit already, then this problem tends to be worse in the brine tank. So I was approached by Gantech, a local chemical company, to test a couple of mixes that they have and to see if that will affect how many pickles are hollow versus not hollow in a trial here at the farm. So if you excuse me, I've got to gear up. different fertilizers. Calcium and boron, calcium, boron, and a proprietary metabolite. A proprietary metabolite on its own and water as a control. If we can improve the internal qualities of cucumbers mid-season, then growers will have a more profitable pack out at the sorting station. And that's the program on pickles, Ben. Wow, Ben, what a program it is. And you can find all of the research from six years of trialing here at this research farm at the Midwest Vegetable Trial Reports website. And now we go to Ben from several days ago at a sweet corn trial. It's huge. Bear, bear with me, just one second. This is a collaboration with 41 states, 41 states. It's a multi-state research project. It's funded by the USDA and NIFA. Um, and all that kind of comes from the Hatch Act of 1887, way back. And it establishes a multi-state research fund for agricultural problems that span many states. 
and we grow a lot of corn in the United States so there's a lot of pests that end up everywhere and this is a part of that project and we can take a look at an important feature of sweet corn this green silk right here attached to the ear because there's a particular bug that loves to lay its eggs right on that thing right there and as it grows it lays more eggs and a little caterpillar goes inside the ear and it's like a whoo surprise to all the customers uh, when they find one of those in there if you can trap for it then you know when it's around and then you can start spraying uh, it can save you some money at least early in the season later in the season into August it's much more likely to be uh, just here so when you've got fresh silking uh, corn you you do have to protect it so uh, another thing that you could do is choose some varieties that may out fight the pest for you without a spray and since 1998 there have been those types of varieties they're called BT varieties there's only two companies that are making them Syngenta and, and Seminus and they have three uh, series or four series that are basically are defined by that BT protein so uh, from Syngenta Attribute is one of those series and it has a protein called Cry 1AB one of the older BT proteins. They also have an Attribute 2 series, which has Cry1AB and a newer protein, VIP3A. There's also a, a newer series called uh, Attribute Plus, which is the same thing it's got as, as Attribute 2, except um, instead of being both Roundup Ready and Liberty Linked, it's just Liberty Linked. And then from Seminus, there's the Performance Series, and that has a BT protein, two BT proteins uh, called Cry1A.105 and Cry2AB, okay, combined like that. What we're doing back at the research farm is we're actually evaluating uh, three of those BT varieties, one of each of those series, and a couple of non-BT varieties that are the analogs or the comparisons to those. So we're looking at sweet corn in many many states, the same five varieties to see if we're starting to lose efficacy on these BT varieties. We already know in some places in the United States that the Cry1AB protein and the Cry1A.105 and Cry2AB they don't work as well as they used to on corn earworm. Uh, they're letting through 60 to 80 percent damaged ears. Uh, however, the VIP3A protein appears to be working well still, and we want to be able to see if it's starting to fail um, and where it's starting to fail. When growers up north start thinking about corn earworm, they're at the whims of whatever is south of them because that pest doesn't actually overwinter up here. It has to blow in every year. And if we find that we're starting to lose efficacy in these BT proteins in a wide scale, that should inform growers on variety selection for the future. Because if they pay extra for a BT variety uh, and then still have to spray it, uh, that's throwing good money on top of bad and they could just get a, a cheaper variety uh, that markets just as well but doesn't have those genes and then spray it um, and be uh, a more profitable option for them. So that's what we're doing this summer on the sweet corn plot at the research farm. That's the sugar on sweet corn. Back to you future Ben. Wow Ben, keep up the great work. You can find more about BT traded sweet corn and their resistance to caterpillar pests with the handy BT sweet corn table found at this website. Now we go back to the field with Ben from several days ago this time in Fenton, Michigan, for a contract and grants job on cabbage. Today is June 19th, and I'm at the Forgotten Harvest Farm here in Fenton, Michigan. This is where we're doing a trial with Michigan State University on a specialty crop block grant through the Department of Agriculture here in Michigan. What we're going to do is compare different planting preparations for summer planted cabbage uh, that is transplanted as a small plant. One of the treatments that we're looking at is to use a cover crop like this rye here that was planted last fall. 
we're going to kill it here in the next week or two. It's been flowering and that's the best time to kill it because it's not going to try to grow back. It's already, you know, done its purpose in life. It's, it's reproduced. Uh, but we're not going to let that seed mature. We're going to try and uh, kill it before then. And we're going to roll it down uh, into a thick mulch. Um, we're going to bring a strip tiller through and that's going to make a four inch wide uh, soil swath down uh, down these rows um, along the length of the direction we've rolled that rye and uh, the other treatments are going to be plastic culture treatments using two different colors of biodegradable plastic mulch one is black which has been the standard biodegradable mulch that's been available for a while now and then we're also going to compare that to white biodegradable mulch uh, in the hopes that the white color uh, won't cook the young plants as black plastic can tend to do. And all of this is going to be compared to uh, this treatment here with the rye mulch and then also a bare soil treatment just to get an idea of um, which, which, uh, which results in the, the fewest dead young transplants and maintains a, a yield that's acceptable for this grower. So uh, we'll come back out here again in July once this has been rolled and the plastic has been laid and transplant those plants for further evaluation. Back to you, future Ben. Ah, I can smell the kraut already. Or maybe it's this frozen bag of sauerkraut right in front of me. If you'd like more information about the trials conducted between MSU and Forgotten Harvest over the years, you can check it out at the Midwest Vegetable Trial Report website. For more information about the results of this trial on cabbages, stay tuned to MSU Extension News. For our final report, we're going to Essexville, Michigan, where Ben, from several days ago, is going to show us a fungicide trial on a collaborating sweet onion growers field that is co-funded by industry groups and an interagency group of governmental organizations, including the EPA and the USDA. Hey there, future Ben. I'm here at Gerald Timms Farm in Essexville, Michigan. The reason I'm here is to get some shots of a trial that's going on here. It's called the IR4 program, which stands for Interregional Project Number no. 4. This thing's been around since 1963. It's a partnership between the USDA, the EPA, chemical companies, and public universities. And uh, it all serves to open up labels for minor specialty crops so that growers of those crops can have some control measures to handle pests, diseases, and weeds. And at Gerald's farm here, we're testing a new fungicide on sweet onions. Uh, it's not labeled yet. This research is being conducted by MSU's plant pathologist named Mary Hausbeck and her lab technician Blair Harlan. No fear of COVID in this one. No fear. <laughs> Came up here today to get that done on June 26th. They're going to do uh, additional sprays on a, a weekly or bi-weekly basis uh, to get a final rating before harvest. Since some of these treatments are not labeled on onions yet, that would make it an adulterant on this crop and it's not harvestable by law for sale. And so one concern that Gerald had as we approached him for this project was can I, um, is there any compensation for those onions that are going to be a bust for me? And uh, we were able to accommodate that. Gerald will be happy, we'll be happy, and more growers will have more options later on. Uh, vegetable growers owe a lot to the IR4 program um, for the choices that they have. Uh, it's the research like this that gets it done. And it's a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful. No, I'm, I'm laying on an onion and I think it's getting to me. But it really is a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful. Oh, these onions are so pretty. Oh, I'm getting emotional. Back to you, future Ben. Oh, Ben, that is such a beautiful story. But maybe it is just the onions. If you'd like more information 
about Mary Hausbeck's trials with fungicides and vegetables, you can check out her website. Well, that just about does it for the Bay Area Vegetable Trials Virtual Field Day. I hope you have fun at your next stop. Thanks for joining us. This is Ben Phillips, signing off. Boy, we need a new driver. <laughs>